and uh, Happy New Year to you coming up. Best wishes for 2019. It will be, and this is kind of odd, uh, the 13th year of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Gee, who celebrates their, what do you do for th- year 13, right? There's, there's buildings that don't have a, a floor 13, right? <laughs> a couple of notes that I want to make. I do think in 2019, you know, the pace of the shows, hopefully not quality of the programs, will slow down a bit. You know, I've been doing this for a while, and I have um, a full-time job still, so the podcasting is not, uh, unfortunately, uh, my full-time gig. But I think, you know, I'll still get the chance to to tackle a lot of topics, and we're just going to go for quality over quantity. I also have 12 years of podcasts to, in the library to go back to, maybe enhance a bit. So, you know, don't worry so much, but it's just a little brief warning that maybe, you know, this isn't going to be weekly as it had been in 2018. Um, premium podcast announcement about that. If you're in the premium podcast, you're in. But it's something that I'm discontinuing in new entrance for now. Um, One of the reasons is the burden of producing two podcasts has just, you know, become too much there. So don't worry, you can still donate to the program at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. And that's really where I think I want to go to. I really appreciate those who have signed up for the premium podcast. But I really think where we should be is to keep this as, you know, it's not something that should be a business. It's not something where I should actually work for you. But... (laughs) even though I do, uh, but rather uh, keep it as doing the podcast for the podcast's sake. And if you want to donate, donate. www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. There's a link there where you can donate. I'm really excited today to relay a podcast from the Ohio v. The World podcast that Alex Hasty does. He does a great job. And if you're a listener to My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, I see every reason why you should be adding Ohio v. The World to your list. First of all, as Alex is going to talk about on on this show, is influenced by My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. And I mean, who'd have thunk that there'd be people out there actually influenced by, you know, me talking into a mic or what have you, but he actually has taken an influence from it. Now, the first thing you might say is, well, why would I be interested in Ohio History Podcast? Because each of Alex's episodes is about a topic in in Ohio history. Well, here's the way to think about that. Ohio history is American history. It's a big state. It's mostly in the middle of the country. And for a lot of history, it was the middle of the country. Heck, in part of history, it was the west of the country, right? Important for the settlement of the country. It was settled by north and south, which gives it a unique role in history. And unique conflicts are still present today. It's been a swing state in elections, so if you go take the 20th century and the 21st century, you only have two elections, 1944 and 1960, where the person that carried the state did not win the presidential election nationally. And in 1944, they ran the governor of Ohio, John Bricker, so, you know, (laughs) and they were running against Roosevelt, so, you know, that goes to show you how important a state it is. There's a lot of electoral votes even today. Um... Alex tackles a lot of great topics. You know, so you want to go to Ohio v. The World Podcast.com. I'm going to relay an episode where he interviews me and we're talking about Curtis LeMay, both a war hero and also VP candidate in 1968 and his story. The episode that came out after the one that I was on on his podcast is also really interesting and it's about Madeline Pollard, who was a young Cincinnati college student who ended up getting involved with a congressman and had a kind of early Me Too story, and we're talking about the 1890s, and she was successful in her lawsuit. So that's a great story, Ohio v. the Patriarchy, that Alex talks about. He's got great topics like that. He does topics about um, things like racial relations relating into Ohio history, talking about Carl Stokes, who was the first urban American, African American mayor. You know, and um, if you ever saw the movie The Fugitive, he looks at the real life case behind that and gives you some facts that are really interesting. Um, If if you remember back in the 1990s about the uh, gentleman who was in Singapore, a young man who got caned 
Alex does a show on that and explains all the details about that and what's happening today. And it's just, you know, he really tackles topics in the way that my history can be to politics does. So full-throated endorsement for uh, Alex Hasty and what he's doing at Ohio V the World. Oh, also, I kind of love his theme music. He drinks a uh, different type of beer while he's recording each episode. Um, you know, I-, I can't engage in that practice because I'm not sure the podcast would come out the way that it, it should. I did take him up on it while we're recording this one. He always drinks a different Ohio beer. He also, um, look, I mean, if you're if you're a Michigan fan, you know, maybe Ohio be the world. You might just a caution that uh, that uh, Alex is, in addition to being a gifted history podcaster, an up and comer, is also a big Ohio fan. So you know, listen with caution. It's hard hey guys, welcome back. It's episode 5, Ohio vs. the Cold War. Our guest today will be Bruce Carlson, one of my favorite podcasters. Uh, he hosts a show called My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. One of the first shows I really started getting into, uh, a history, politics and history show, American history. Um, and he just does such a great job, gets just awesome guests, national guests. Uh, I always end up reading... The books from his his guests and, and this will be his third time joining our show today we're going to talk about the cold war and the ultimate cold warrior columbus native general curtis lemay talking about all kinds of different parts of his career uh, and we will walk you through world war ii the the fire bombing of japan the victory in the pacific the dropping of the atom bomb we'll also talk about the berlin airlift that curtis lemay helped manage in 1948-1949. Uh, we'll look at the 1950s, the building of the Strategic Air Command, our nuclear air force when you know, B-29s, B-52s were flying all over the skies 24 hours a day under the direction of Curtis LeMay. And also we'll talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Vietnam War. LeMay was the front and center for all of those things. But without further ado, let's talk to Bruce Carlson about how we got here. It's episode 5, Ohio versus the Cold War. Today we're talking about Curtis LeMay, born in 1906. He grew up a poor Columbus kid uh, on the west side originally. He saw his first flight at age four. Um, flying at age 16 for just five minutes, but one of the greatest thrills of his life. But a kid who grew up ultimately on the south side of Columbus, on Welch Avenue. Uh, It's actually right near, a friend of mine opened a bar called Eight and Sand Tavern. Um, A really cool place. Go check them out. They are on Innis, just off of High Street, kind of Hungarian village, just a couple of blocks away from the childhood home of Curtis LeMay. So the next time you're on the south side of Columbus, go check out Eight and Sand Tavern, uh, and you'll be glad you did. This is a kid, the oldest son, Curtis, who grew up with, with paper route and jobs, all kinds of jobs, hardworking kid, um, makes his way to Ohio State. While he's at Ohio State in the 1920s, he, he's actually working six days a week at a, at a local foundry, um, and he, school's incredibly difficult with how little time he's spending on it. We're going to play throughout this episode uh, just some clips of LeMay, and we'll start uh, with multiple interviews that we were able to find about his youth in Columbus. And, of course, you're a native of Columbus, Ohio, aren't you? Went to high State? I was born in uh, Columbus and uh, went to high school there. Uh, Went to Ohio State. I have a degree in civil engineering, which I've never used, by the way. I went directly into the Air Force. LeMay does join the Army. He would go back to Ohio State and finish and get his degree in civil engineering. He meets a woman named Helen Maitland. She's actually an Ann Arbor native. We're just a couple days off Ohio State's beatdown of of Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan Wolverines at the Horseshoe. Uh, Miss Ohio View the World and I were in attendance, ran on the field like a couple of kids, just a great day, great win by the Buckeyes. But he actually married a woman from Ann Arbor. Her family ultimately lived in, in Cleveland Heights, a town that I've lived in on the near east side of Cleveland. They marry, and as, as LeMay you know, finishes at Ohio State, he also joins the Army Air Corps. There was no Air Force back then. 
through the 1930s, which what Bruce really calls kind of the nadir of the Air Force. You know, when war breaks out, there's only three B-17s, you know, guarding our, our, our left coast. And he ascends his way through the military in the 1930s. But when war breaks out in 1941, Bruce talks about how Curtis LeMay wasn't shocked. We'll talk to Bruce Carlson from My History Can Beat Up Your Politics about just how unprepared the United States were for World War II. We'll then hear from General LeMay himself about the preparedness or lack thereof of the Army Air Corps. And we'll hear that famous speech from FDR the day after Pearl Harbor when he discussed December 7th, 1941 as a day that will live in infamy. Yeah, I mean, there are very few planes, few planes of a meaningful level. There was a difficulty securing funding from the Congress for the Air Force because America was in, uh, it, the word isolationist gets thrown around too much, but let's say a non-interventionist mode during the 30s. And it was also a depression and money was scarce. And congressmen in Tennessee that were looking for dam projects and um, money for relief um, did not like the sound of paying a lot for expensive bombers. Curtis LeMay comes into the Air Force um, right in the right in this period in probably its nadir. Um, and when we were least prepared. In spite of the advice that our first president gave us when he left office, if we wanted peace, uh, be prepared for war, or worse to that effect. We never have. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, our peacetime uh, Army Air Corps before World War II was composed of about 1,200 officers and about 10,000 men. And we expanded to two and a half million during the war. With that few people to start with, and we had to build an Air Force. We didn't have one. We had to build an Air Force. We had to build the airplanes. We had to build the factories to build the airplanes. We had to train the workers to build them, uh, get them built, debug them, test them, put them in the combat, train the people to fly them in combat, and fight at the same time. And that's, uh, it got to be uh, pretty hairy at times. We're really unprepared, no doubt about it. And uh, this made a, a, an impression on me that uh, I still have. And that is that no American will ever have to go through that experience again. And I swore that if I ever had an opportunity to do anything about it, I would do it. Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate, of the House of Representatives, Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. When Pearl Harbor happened, the interesting thing about uh, Curtis LeMay's reaction is that while everyone else is shocked, he's not at all. He felt this was exactly the move that they were going to make, given all the geo strategy that had played out before and where Japan was being aggressive, where Japan was looking to secure territory, secure resources is a big deal. Yeah. When you look at the attack on Hawaii, um, yeah, LeMay wasn't surprised and he felt we were extremely uh, underprepared. Curtis LeMay begins leading pilots on bombing runs in the Western theater in Europe. And he has a great success. He doesn't just fly. He says he'll fly lead on many missions. He would, he really never gave an order uh, that he hadn't already done or wouldn't do himself. LeMay actually comes back to the United States, back to DC in 1943, and he's a hero at the Pentagon. He didn't realize how high esteem, how much you know high esteem people held him in. He goes on a speaking tour. He goes back to visit his family in Cleveland, his wife Helen and their daughter. And even even as he was older, he still talked about how abundant things were compared to Europe in 1943, and how Cleveland had you know central heating and abundant food. It wasn't like that in England. But he's ultimately transferred in 1944 to Japan. 
as the air war begins to become one more one-sided against the Nazis in Europe, the battle for Japan is, is intensifying. He transfers to Japan, and he's an innovator, dealing with the high winds, the incredible uh, firepower of anti-aircraft that the Japanese mainland possessed in their islands. And also, the, the, which made, you know, bombers have to bomb from very high up. But LeMay changes the game. He brings the war to the Japanese through the air that, like, no one ever has. He's the guy to get things done. He's a little bit well-known in the country because now, after the war, his picture's been on um, Time and Look and yeah. some of the big national magazines. Uh, the big cigar, they call him. Had, it, uh, had his career just continued the way it was in the 30s, we never would have heard about. Right. But it was his time. And during the World War II, he fashioned bombing raids like over Germany that were so well planned, so well executed. He figured out what the weak points. I mean, he'd go up in a plane and he'd uh, at first he was piloting and realized I can't pilot anymore. I got to I got to look in the gunner's seat. I got to look and get a view of the formation. And he realized the exact amount of the exact position of the formation they needed to defend best against fighters, the kind of the flying uh, fortress formation. And then he um, he calculated that this, he was a whiz in terms of numbers, data, facts, calculations. And this is like you have to imagine this is before Excel, before spreadsheets. I can only imagine the people, the subordinates that work for him knew, you know, when you see the big cigar at the desk, he's looking over papers and stuff. Do not disturb. Do not disturb him. <laughs> that will not go well for you because he's in the middle of figuring something out. And he might be hours, he might be a full day, but he came out of it. So he came up with the exact amount of runs you could make before losing a bomber. As the U.S. sustains terrible losses, places like Iwo Jima and Okinawa, even more massive losses for the Japanese, it becomes clear that the Japanese are never going to give up. Unlike the Germans, their, their defense almost gets stiffer as things get more dire. You know, p- places where, you know, there are battles on islands where 99% of the Japanese soldiers had to be killed before, before the fighting was over. With the assistance of technology, terrible technology, LeMay introduces incendiaries into the battle in the Pacific. They had already been used at places like Dresden and Hamburg, the fire bombings where 40,000 people would be killed in an attack. It's terror bombing. But he introduces this to the Japanese and the famous firebombing of Tokyo. We'll talk to Bruce about the firebombing March 9th and March 10th, 1945. March 9th is the deadliest day, I believe, in human history. At the hands of, of General LeMay, some 325 B-29 take off and bomb napalm as we know it now onto the, cit- the cities and the buildings in Tokyo. Tokyo, known for having so many wood structures and these high winds, that combination, I believe, leads to about 100,000 deaths in the first day of the firebombing of Tokyo, the deadliest day, in our belief, in human history. It is the antithesis of the type of bombing that you hear about today or that you might have heard about in the first Gulf War where there's so much emphasis by the military now on, well, we're bombing strategically, we're, we're bombing with pinpoint accuracy, we're hitting our targets. Curtis LeMay was a believer in those things, certainly, and a believer in the Air Force improving its accuracy, certainly. But firebombing is the exact opposite of that. It's where um, you're attaching to the bomb a chemical that is to propel fire, an incendiary um, chemical that is to that is to uh, spread fire and and it is exactly intended to exact more damage than the bomb could possibly do and also uh, where accuracy is not going to be as important because hitting anywhere will lead to a fire that's very difficult to put out by uh, people that are going to be just having suffered a bombing raid and other attacks are very strained um, and and difficult to coordinate fire prevention. It's intended to do a lot of damage. It was a response, and um, there was a lot of anger in the United States, particularly aimed at Japan, also aimed at the Germans, but particularly aimed at Japan because of the Pearl Harbor strike, which was seen as a 
cheap sneak attack. So you can imagine that Curtis LeMay was not the only one who would have very little problem throwing out the window any ethical notion, per se, and trying to do the most damage possible. And firebombing does just that. And areas of Japan had these winds that um, really uh, made a lot of precise bombing difficult as well. And Japan had um, very good air defenses. So to avoid the wind, you know, it was hard to stay high up because of the winds. And it was hard to go too low because they had very good and well-manned air defenses in, in, in Japan. And so those winds contributed, the wood buildings contributed... Keeps on going. The firebombing of the B-29s, Osaka, Japan, Nagoya, Kobe, Nagoya again. They only stop on March 20th after some 12 days because they run out of incendiaries. Brutal LeMay, as they call him. He's on the cover of Time magazine, cheered in the States. He literally starts checking off cities in a world almanac. He's bombing cities in Japan by population, one after another, on down the list. LeMay also would oversee the dropping of the atom bomb by Columbus' own Paul Tibbetts. Go back and listen to a previous episode we did with Bruce, our season two premiere last year, Ohio versus the bomb, about that mission um, that entered us into the atomic age. LeMay actually couldn't be, uh, couldn't fly anymore. Once he found out about that in late 1944, he was grounded. Simply having that information, if you could be shot down, somehow could be extracted from you through torture or whatever, they would no longer let a person fly um, in combat after they found out about the Manhattan Project. But the war ends in August of uh, 1945, and the Cold War begins almost immediately. And as the Iron Curtain descends on Europe, as Winston Churchill would say, the Cold War begins, the Soviets get the bomb on August 19th, 1949, and they have their first detonation. LeMay, having risen to nearly the top of the new U.S. Air Force, uh, the Air Force created after the war is its own separate branch of the military, and it's up to LeMay to whip him into shape. But as the Soviets get the, get the bomb, tensions grow immediately. This is the Cold War that we all know. Mutually assured destruction, deterrence, massive bomb tests. I can't do anything without Cold War without playing the, the song and the movie that they would play to kids in the 1950s, Duck and Cover, from the Civilian Air Defense Corps. Uh, this has a little turtle that's you know, showing kids what to do after the Russians he attack. He He knew just what to do. He's Duck and Cover. Duck and Cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Duck and cover. Be sure and remember what Bert the Turtle just did, friends, because every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. This is an official civil defense film produced in cooperation with the Federal Civil Defense Administration. Be ready for a new danger. The atomic bomb. First, you have to know what happens when an atomic bomb explodes. You will know when it comes. We hope it never comes, but we must get ready. It looks something like this. There is a bright flash, brighter than the sun, brighter than anything you've ever seen. If you were not ready and did not know what to do, it could hurt you in different ways. It could knock you down hard or throw you against a tree or a wall. It is such a big explosion It can smash in buildings and knock signboards over and break windows all over town. But if you duck and cover like Bert, you will be much safer. Duck and cover, a Cold War classic right there. The Soviet Union takes over the entirety of Eastern Europe, a good half of Germany, and most of Berlin, which is actually in the East German sector. The four nations actually divide Berlin into four separate regions, the Americans, the French, the British, and the Soviets. Berlin is the front line of the Cold War, and it always would be. 
Yeah, it was an extremely precarious position. I mean, at the end of the war, it might not have been clear, you know, when the initial deals were made and, and maybe maybe FDR. I always think that FDR figured, look, no one thinks that they're going to pass away, right? <laughs> you know, no one thinks right. that's going to happen. We all think we're immortal, or, or at least we have a few more years left, right? Uh, I think FDR was that way. He figured he'd still be around. He figured he could handle Stalin. First of all, like all Germans at this time, there's a bitter resentment against the Russians and the Soviets because the Soviets had come in there. They had, they were the first to reach Berlin. They had suffered greatly, and they took it out absolutely on the people of Berlin, the pillaging, raping, stealing, killing. Um, it was already a bombed-out city. The people are already desperate. And so they, uh, but they do one brave thing. And in 1946, there's an election in which the people of Berlin throw out the um, socialist or communist parties. Now, this is in the American, British and French sectors. Right. And it's a, it's a statement um, to Stalin that, uh, you know, against Soviet power and Soviet reach. Things in Berlin escalate quickly, as they tend to do with someone like Stalin on the other side. The Soviets have some 1.5 million troops in Germany, in the surrounding area. The United States has about 30,000. The Soviets use this this strong-arm tactic, and they close off Berlin. They seal all the roads. They set up checkpoints. No trains coming in. They're starving out the people so they'll depend on the Soviets. They're forcing the Allies out of Berlin. When you hear that phrase the leader of the free world, the president is the leader of the free world. That's really all about Berlin. And that's, that's the origin of it. The allied nations get together. The first thing they say is, we're uniting our sectors. Soviets don't like this very much. It's like, now it's like three against one. Then they introduce this new currency to try to stabilize Berlin. The Soviets don't want this. Stalin doesn't want They want Berlin exactly the way it is, desperate, hungry, so they have to come to the Soviets for what little food they're going to give them. So once the Deutschmark is introduced, and this is to have an effect of stabilizing the country, and, you know, Stalin has indicated through, word gets to, uh, to the Americans, to the Bulgarians, that Stalin's grumbling about this is going to be, we need to have a Soviet Germany. They block the roads yeah. and won't allow any uh, Allied trucks from larger Germany to come into Berlin. On June 24th, 1948, the Berlin airlift starts with a call to the subject of today's show, Curtis LeMay. LeMay made a major general in 1944 at the age of 37. Still the youngest in the military at that time. He would actually become the youngest four-star general in American military history since Ulysses S. Grant when he was named a, a full general in 1951. But the Berlin airlift and the relief of the millions of Berliners begins with a call to LeMay, a call about how much coal can he get to the starving people of Berlin, Germany. We asked Bruce about that call, and we'll hear a little newsreel footage about the Berlin airlift, the most important air operation of the entire Cold War. And there was nothing like it had ever been done. This is why it's so surprising to the Soviets, for instance, and they don't think it's going to last until it reaches a point where they're there's a year passes and it's they're still delivering and it's like, well, gosh, I guess this can happen. But you're talking about playing cargo planes continuously because you have to feed a, a city and feed and clothe and and heat a city of um, of almost three million people. I mean, that's a lot. These planes just continue. Your orders were if you messed up the landing. You didn't get to try again. Right. You had to let the next plane go in, and you went home with your stuff. Try it again later, because it was an, an assembly line precision of deliveries in these, like, three makeshift runways that they had to, you know, one of them they just had to put the asphalt on. It didn't, it was, it was a small, like, municipal airport that they was surrounded by apartment buildings, and they, they turned it into a uh, professional runway for this event. Endless cars of vitally needed coal are stalled by the Russian blockade of Berlin. But that is only part of the story. As the red noose is drawn closer about the western sector of the capital, switches are pulled on generators, and the fuel famine forces drastic power cuts. 
Berlin becomes a city of darkness as all ground communication is severed and industry comes to a standstill. But the Western Allies fight back with an airlift of 450 flights daily, carrying thousands of tons of food into the beleaguered capital, flying an air corridor threatened by red fighter planes. Backing up the shuttle are 60 B-29s, which arrive at an airfield in England, a base from which American planes once bombed Germany. Now these Yanks may fly on a mission of mercy, the feeding of hungry Germans in Berlin. We are not going to be forced out of Berlin. Will you be able to continue the present air supply indefinitely? We will increase it, and we can continue it indefinitely. I uh, want to express uh, our great pleasure at uh, the assumption of this responsibility by General LeMay. He was one of the uh, most distinguished combat commanders in World War II. He played a most instrumental role in developing SAC into its present uh, high peak as the great shield of the United States in the free world. So, General, we want to say that uh, speaking personally and also uh, as president, that it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you as the new uh, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force and a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Mr. President, I appreciate very much your taking the time out from your busy schedule to participate in, in this ceremony. Uh, I'm sure you realize that you're a member of, of the armed services uh, becoming chief of staff of his service is the highest honor that can come to him. You can go back and listen to our second to last episode last season, Ohio versus Peace, about the Bosnian War. We talk a lot about the besieged city of, of Sarajevo. In that, from 1992 to 1996, NATO airlifted 180,000 tons of goods into Sarajevo over, like I said, about a four over four year period. That equals about one month of the amount of tonnage of supplies and coal and food that are being delivered to Berlin. A thousand flights a day. Someone landing every 60 seconds. You know, that 180,000 Sarajevo, like I said, is one month's total. We would lose 28 airmen, three Navy officers, and 39 Royal Air Force from, from England during the Berlin airlift. But in May, 11 months after it started, the Soviets opened the roads to Berlin, and the airlift was victorious. LeMay wasn't there. Shortly after the airlift began, he, he was transferred to take over SAC, the Strategic Air Command, in Omaha. It was SAC that the, the Air Force ran. Uh, the Strategic Air Command handled our nuclear arsenal and was not in good shape when LeMay arrives in 1948. We asked Bruce about Strategic Air Command, its importance in the Cold War, and the role of Curtis E. LeMay. Strategic Air Command was the arm of the Air Force that was responsible for delivering nuclear payout on our enemy. Curtis LeMay takes this over and finds it in sorry shape. He's not very happy about it. One of the things he does very quickly is he orders all of the Strategic Air Command to bomb Dayton, Ohio. Oh, now, yeah, yeah. Not for real, <laughs> but, but uh, electronically uh, simulated. So the planes go to Dayton and not a single one hits the target. As he was prone to do, this was his nature, uh, he wanted to test the edges to, to always to be prepared and also to do something very bold. I mean, LeMay is about bold action. So he orders this you know, simulated attack on Dayton, Ohio. It doesn't succeed. And, you know, I think the... Um, uh, one might think he would chew everybody out, but uh, that's not exactly the way LeMay was for his image of being the big cigar and a kind of gruff guy who demanded action and improvement. Um, LeMay was also a guy that would put himself under any rules he gave out to anyone else. He would always say, we, we have to work to improve this. But the demonstration of that failed attack showed that SAC couldn't do what it was promising the president it could do, and within the organization, and certainly in LeMay's mind, 
He knew that uh, it had to get better. Curtis LeMay believed in the LeMay Doctrine. The LeMay Doctrine basically said that if you must go to war, then you must win war. Use overpowering offensive capabilities to guarantee victory. If you can't promise that, then don't get involved. We talked to Bruce about the LeMay Doctrine, and we hear it from the man himself. General LeMay talks about his own doctrine of overwhelming force. Yeah, I mean, that's the LeMay Doctrine. If a nation... You know, a nation should think long and hard about going to war, but once a nation does, that it should be unreserved in how it prosecutes that war, and it should try to end it as quickly as possible. And no, I don't think that that became very popular with most of the civilian part of the, of the equation here, the commander-in-chiefs um, over our history. Uh, Truman famously pulled back MacArthur, in Korea, when, when MacArthur was starting to attack uh, North Korea and attacking some of the Chinese areas where they were helping supply North Korea. Um, LeMay, you know, also weighs in on Korea, and he wants bombing of North Korea, and particularly ports where they're being supplied, so that we can end this war faster. And you don't see... You know, the, these ideas are not popular always with the American people. There is an exception, and I would say that is the the Gulf War, the uh, 91, uh, with the first President George Bush, um, in yeah. that he decides to kind of execute this plan. And there is tremendous, um, a, tr- a tremendous amount of bombing of the Baghdad, and then that is... You know, to the point at which when there is a ground war, mostly you know, armored divisions and um, support units, it's a total war. It's a big attack on this country, and it's not something where, you know, we hold back. It's controversial. It changes the image of him um, by advocating for such things. But if you look at the um, Cuba and what happens during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he advocates this same thing, that we should just go in there and bomb these missile sites and just bomb Cuba. Once the decision is made to use military force, then I think it should be used as quickly as possible, with as much strength as necessary, more strength than necessary probably, so you don't miscalculate. The main thing is to, to get it over with as quickly as possible. The Cold War was a war between Western democracies and Eastern communism. But communism spreads west, just 90 miles off the coast of Florida, in Cuba with Fidel Castro, backed by Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of Russia, in 1960. And in 1962, under President John F. Kennedy, in an Air Force, and the chief of staff then of Curtis LeMay, the general, they make a startling discovery. Their surveillance planes see tons of missile sites. They see fighter bombers being constructed on the little island of Cuba, like we said, just off the coast of Miami. The Cuban Missile Crisis, as we know it, in October of 1962. LeMay was there with JFK in all these meetings as they decide what to do. We first hear from uh, President Kennedy as he describes the situation in an alarming broadcast to the nation. This government feels obliged to report this new crisis to you in fullest detail. The characteristic of these new missile sites indicate two distinct types of installations. Several of them include medium range ballistic missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead for a distance of more than 1,000 nautical miles. Each of these missiles in short is capable of striking Washington, D.C., the Panama Canal, Cape Canaveral, Mexico City, or any other city in the southeastern part of the United States. Additional sites not yet completed appear to be designed for intermediate range ballistic missiles capable of traveling more than twice as far and thus capable of striking most of the major cities in the Western Hemisphere. By the presence of these large, long-range, and clearly offensive weapons, 
of sudden mass destruction constitutes an explicit threat to the peace and security of all the Americas. As those tense days passed in October, the world came about as close as it's come to nuclear war. General LeMay, um, they had founded a plan that included dropping 160 nuclear weapons on the island of Cuba before the Russians could finish all their their missile production uh, and be able to to launch retaliatory strikes. Many of these were tactical nuclear missiles, but nonetheless, it would have wiped basically the, the island of Cuba off the map. There's tapes of all these arguments and debates between the generals and the president and the civilian leadership. LeMay says to the president, well, you're, you're really in a pickle here, sir. And he says, General, you're right there with me. We talked to Bruce about the options that President Kennedy had and the role of Curtis LeMay in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He could bomb the sites. He could bomb the government of Cuba, bomb Castro. He could uh, launch an invasion of the island. Um, it was a little politically difficult for him after the Bay had pigs and sure. he had abandoned that group. So he was going to have to do it with overwhelming force in a LeMay style if he was going to do it. it was, he wasn't going to get help from the Cuban insurgents this time uh, because they, they already betrayed them, in their opinion, once. So, um, yeah, there were, there were um, of course, there were military options involving other places around the world. We could launch a nuclear strike on the Soviet Union in the, in the most extreme, uh, used conventional forces somewhere that would hurt them put in place missiles in places just as they had done to us. So there were a number of these like type of military options on the table. Um, Kennedy, I think, decided early on that he was going to go for a more reasonable, peaceful solution to talk, to have some bed. The Kennedy way, and his father taught him well, is always have a back channel. And they had a back channel through the Russian ambassador and Bobby Kennedy and to talk and try to also sending note to Khrushchev at this time and trying to get them to um, to back down and remove these missiles. LeMay was not a fan of this whole... Um, and, and they end up pursuing a blockade, which means you're going to quarantine Cuba and not allow any further um, Soviet vessels to go in to supply these missiles. LeMay is not a fan of the, any of these steps, and certainly not the blockade. You're just going to get people killed you, you, you got to make a decision. They're putting um, missiles right there in, that can aim at Florida. You got to take them out. We could have come to war without extraordinary leadership. It certainly could have. And to think that the, you know, now we're really in hindsight mode in terms of how we view the old Soviet Union, that since everything worked out in the end and they eventually got Gorbachev, that it was always like that. It was an extremely military society. You know, we were military. LeMay was a part of that military, but we were, our military is controlled by civilians. And in fact, the military control of the country was a lot smaller than in the Soviet Union. So what a kind of paranoid general might have done in the Soviet Union. Uh, It's now known that in the Cuban case that the commanders, the Soviet commanders on the ground in Cuba had the ability to make the decision to launch a strike. It did not have to come from the Kremlin. Speaks to JFK's considerable leadership skills. One of the things famously (laughs) he says about all these generals advising him, and perhaps LeMay is one of them, you know, is that, you know, they have the advantage. I mean, if we go to a nuclear war, you know, none of them will be around to tell us that we're wrong. You know, As the naval blockade averts disaster in Cuba, LeMay, still the head of the Air Force, a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, begins dealing with a, a problem in Vietnam, begins under Kennedy, and escalates under Johnson after Kennedy's assassination in November of 63. LeMay, again, the LeMay Doctrine uh, was completely not used in Vietnam. Overwhelming force if you go to war. And as LeMay is out, he retires in 1965, he never understood the Vietnam conflict and the way it was fought. He had made himself a target 
of the peaceniks and the hippies um, who wanted an end to the violence. And they saw him as, you know, the number one enemy when it comes to nuclear proliferation and the cause of war. We ask Bruce about Vietnam and we hear from Curtis LeMay himself about his questioning of the decisions that led to the Vietnam War. Because of his stances and because of his desire to use overwhelming force, it makes it really easy to attack him and to pull out his quotes. One of the things that he says in a book is that he'd like to bomb Vietnam into the Stone Age. He later said that the ghostwriter put that in and he hadn't caught it in his review of the book. I didn't really say it, but it really is classic LeMay. Mm -hmm. And um, he he felt that, um, you know, that we should be bombing North Vietnam because they're the ones that started the crisis and they're the ones that need to be made to suffer. Now, interestingly enough, after all a long time in the Vietnam War, Nixon ends up adopting the strategy, but well later than when uh, LeMay had proposed it in the mid 60s, you know, which is essentially bombing the supply ports so that North Vietnamese cannot continue the fight. That was a crazy idea in the mid 60s. And then Nixon does it in 70. My favorite movie of all time is 1964 Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, the man who gave you Full Metal Jacket, and Shining, many other great films, made a, m- a movie almost lampooning the Cold War and nuclear war. He has a character played by George C. Scott, General Buck Turgidson, who's modeled after General LeMay. And, and basically in Dr. Strangelove, there's a, a rogue U.S. uh, Army commander who sends a raid to bomb, nuclear bomb, the Soviet Union. And George C. Scott and the president, played by Peter Sellers, try to stop it with the help of the Russians. We'll play you a clip uh, from the movie as George C. Scott, the Curtis LeMay character, describes what he would do in this terrible situation uh, of nuclear annihilation facing the Soviet Union and ultimately the counterstrike. But I implore you, go watch Dr. Strangelove. It's a great film. Uh, It's in black and white, but it is fantastic. But as Vietnam escalates, Curtis LeMay is retired. An over 30-year career, uh, like we said, the youngest four-star general since Ulysses S. Grant. We hear from LeMay, um, as many people called for him to make a political run. He was retired, moved to California. Um, staying busy on boards of National Geographic, uh, also a small electronics company that he was running, and also on the board of what would become Columbus-based NetJets, uh, a private air provider uh, for executives and other people. Still a very, very successful company. Uh, but we hear from Curtis LeMay about a possible run for the presidency and his retirement. General, in Time magazine, they said that you might be interested in running for president. Is this true? Uh, I'm not a candidate, no. You're I've, not a uh, candidate. I've, uh, uh, ever since I retired, received uh, literally hundreds of letters from people all over the country uh, suggesting that I run for the presidency or for the Senate or get into politics or do something. And uh, I've always given them about the same answer, that uh, we in the military are never not interested in politics. We always considered it a nonpartisan issue, as a matter of fact. But uh, just because you... Uh, hang up your uniform, you don't forget the country, and if there's sufficient demand for me to serve the country again, certainly I would I would consider it. But uh, I haven't seen that overwhelming demand as yet. Before I retired, uh, I'm uh, chairman of the board of a small electronics firm, uh, and uh, vice chairman of the board of a, uh, uh, the Executive Jet Aviation, which is a, a small air operation that uh, is operated by some of my ex uh, strategic air command uh, officers. I haven't been able to do the hunting and the fishing that I planned on doing when I moved to California. In March 1968, LBJ, President Johnson, decides not to run for re-election. The path to the White House is wide open. The Republicans ultimately nominate uh, Richard Nixon. The Democrats, following the assassination of Robert Kennedy in June, nominate Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey. But there's a third-party candidate, and it's George Wallace. He's someone we talked about in the Ohio vs. Jim Crow episode. Uh, 
a staunch segregationist. Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, he famously said as governor. He's running on his own ticket, and he's picking up an amazing amount of votes. Not just talking about his racist ideals, but a lot of the stuff that we hear today from some of our politicians about jobs going overseas, about the political correct culture, uh, railing against the left for what he deems to be their intolerance of free speech. We hear from Bruce about the crazy election of 1968 and the campaign of Governor George Wallace. Yeah. Now, going to 1968, you also have a third party campaign. There's not too many of them in American history, but that's one of the big ones. George Wallace is running a, a, a pretty good effort, and he's starting to get northern votes. And he's getting around October something like 21 percent in some of the opinion polls. And he's really aiming to steal votes from both parties because the Democrats still have this kind of Southern. Now, they're losing it, but they have a Southern base. Wallace is also going to pull some of the Southern vote that Nixon wants. And he's pulling from both sides a kind of blue-collar white worker that's a little resentful uh, at other races. And George Wallace is a segregationist. He's the guy who famously stood in the door of the university and wouldn't allow black students in. Um, he doesn't start out this way. He is an interesting history that could be told, uh, of course, in another episode or something. But he's, you know, he starts out a little bit more moderate, but yeah, gives that does. up quickly. He's a showman, and he knows how to get votes. And by this point in 68, he's well-established, well-established as a segregationist candidate. You're voting for George Wallace. You're voting for racism, either directly or kind of a more subtle, like, I didn't get this job promotion because... Uh, there was an African American in the running type, subtle, more subtle racism that was going on. Wallace's rallies were often the scenes of, of great protests and a lot of cheering. Uh, some of the kind of some of the stuff you'd you'd almost see at an early 2016 Trump uh, a Trump rally when it comes to the crowd fighting amongst itself. We asked Bruce about those rallies. You know, he once did a rally. Uh, and right before the election with his vice president, who we'll talk about today, LeMay, they sold out Madison Square Garden. 20,000 people in, in New York City coming out to hear this man speak. He was making serious inroads, up above 20% of the vote. Maybe getting enough votes to throw it, throw it into you know a, a decision by the House of Representatives as no one would get the majority uh, of electoral votes needed, 270. Um, if Wallace wins all these southern states, if he can win even in the, the upper south, it certainly would be thrown to the house and chaos would ensue. We hear from Bruce about some of these rallies and we'll hear some clips of Wallace taking on hippies and radicals, as he called them, the radical left. When you, you know, with the Wallace rallies, he would, there would be, of course, people protesting him. I mean, this is 68. You have the counterculture now. You've got people that don't like uh, him, they want him off the national stage. They're protesting every rally he does, particularly because he starts going north. He's having rallies in Illinois and Ohio and places like this. The protesters show up. Wallace loves it. He eats it up because he goes toe for toe with the hecklers because he knows, as I think I suspect was happening with some of the Trump rallies, that people are saluting him for taking on these these hecklers. But they mean free speech only if you let them speak. They don't want anybody else to speak. And I tell you, I love you too. I sure do. Oh, I thought you were a she. You a he. Oh, my goodness. And when he was in California, a group of anarchists laid out in front of his automobile and threatened his personal safety. The president of the United States. Well, I want to tell you, if you would elect me the president, and I go to California, well, I come to Arkansas, and some of them lie down in front of my automobile 
the most confusing things I've ever really read about the 1968 election. A crazy time. Johnson gets out. MLK's killed. Robert F. Kennedy's killed. Uh, the ra- you know the 1968 Democratic Convention, the riots and police, you know brutality in the streets of Chicago. An amazing election. But one of the most surprising things that happens is that Curtis LeMay, the retired general, comes out of retirement and accepts, after denying it once, George Wallace's invitation to become his vice president. Like we said, Wallace is cleaning up in the polls. He's in, you know, 21, 22%, even more in some, um, especially down south. He doesn't name LeMay until a month before the election. But we talked to Bruce about LeMay's decision, his baffling decision, his legacy-ruining decision to join George Wallace's presidential ticket. One of their contributors suggests, what about Curtis LeMay? And you can see the image. We talked a bit about the counterculture being kind of turning on LeMay, the Dr. Strangelove image. And this is everything that Wallace now wants. And Wallace is also looking for, like any third-party candidate, always you know that foreign policy credential, exactly. that who's going to run the military when you, unexperienced, no you know, we'll, we'll assume the presidency. And uh, he's forced to pick a vice presidential candidate, not because there's any convention, because he's just running an independent campaign, but because some states require it. So he has to pick a person. Um, someone has to become vice president. So um, yeah, that's at good. first they say no. At first, you know, LeMay says no. He's never been involved in politics. He, he, what The thing to understand is that He really has no personal like for Wallace, no personal like for the ideas that he espouses. And it must be said that Curtis LeMay could not be considered a racist. In fact, he's one of the integral figures to implement the integration of the military in in the Air Force, which is the area that he commanded. And, And he doesn't just do it, you know, under duress. He does it gung ho enthusiastically and does it in a way that will ensure that it will work. Uh, LeMay is the kind of guy that when the president orders him to do something, he gets it done. And there was never any evidence among any friends that he would be into the kind of like segregationist policies of Wallace. So first he says no, but I, I suspect it's a mixture of you're talking about a person that was extremely frenetic and active and now is working for an electronics company, doesn't really like, he's yeah. retired, his, his family's like, you know, oh gosh, he's, he's always like, it's kind of having him at home is not a very easy thing because he's used to being in charge of things. And there's this opportunity. I suspect that the other uh, motivation is that he just doesn't like Johnson and Humphrey by association and what the way the military is now and the way it's being run and what they're doing in Vietnam. He feels they're bungling it. They're just, you know, leading to more American deaths by not taking decisive action and sees an opportunity to enter the national stage to change it, even if that way of entry was bizarre. Wallace had considered people like Happy Chandler, governor of Kentucky, to be his vice president, but he was too liberal after you know, allowing Jackie Robinson to enter baseball when he was the commissioner. Men like John Connolly, the Texas governor, uh, who a Democrat, uh, later turned Republican, who was actually in the car with JFK when he was shot in Dallas. Even I heard rumors of Colonel Sanders, no joke, the actual colonel. But he settles on LeMay. They try for weeks and weeks to get LeMay to join the ticket, and he finally does. And they plan a giant press conference to introduce Curtis LeMay as the vice presidential candidate. And it's in Pittsburgh. It's in a hotel ballroom. Dozens and dozens of reporters are there. LeMay's going to give it, you know, a speech and answer questions. But General LeMay was no politician. And this, you know, first appearance turns into one of the great vice presidential blunders of all time. It ends the Wallace campaign, any serious contention for the presidency. It ends any idea that this election could be thrown into a decision to be made by the House. One simple question to LeMay about nuclear weapons, and the whole thing goes off the rails. You have to remember, it's 1968. We're we're fighting 
a conventional war, and a war in Vietnam, but a conventional one. You know, it's bombing, it's ground troops, it's napalm. I mean, it's it's a lot of things, but it's not nuclear weapons was not the subject of discussion in '68. Really, um, there was a they didn't quite have detente yet, but uh, Brezhnev had just taken over in the Soviet Union. There was a change there. There wasn't an immediate crisis. You know, in fact, there, we, there may have been some conflict between the Chinese and the Soviets were keeping them busy. You know, it, it wasn't, this wasn't the big topic among so many in, in, in 68. So the aides tell him, the Wallace's aides, who were really just, you know, some Alabama folks, uh, like, you know, they're so excited, first of all, that this Curtis LeMay has decided to join this ticket. Mm -hmm. This makes the Wallace LeMay ticket now something more than it ever was. I'm not entirely sure Wallace liked that, by the way. Uh, Wallace didn't want to share the stage with anybody, but he, oh, yeah. he has to. He has to. But this just makes this campaign more than just about Wallace now. It's a, an American national ticket with a war hero on it. So they're excited, but they do tell him, you know, don't talk about nuclear weapons. You made a lot of statements about that. <laughs> Let's just, this is not what this is about. I don't know that telling Curtis LeMay what to do is going to be very effective in any situation. And he's not going to hold back. He doesn't have a politician's grace. He, you know, famously in the past when they located the Strategic Air Command in Omaha, you know, he's asked by one of the local papers, like, isn't this going to be great for Omaha? And he gives an answer like, I don't think it's going to be great for Omaha. You know, or I don't, you know, I don't know that it's going to be great for Omaha. It's like it's it's an answer of something he has in his head, meaning we don't know that this is great yet. The Strategic Air Command, we have a lot of work to do. That's the way LeMay thought. But it's such an impolitic answer that offended people initially in Omaha greatly and just gave him this reputation of this this cra uh, craven brute. Um, here he's asked about nuclear weapons and just continues to talk about the, the use of nuclear weapons and that. Americans are too dovish, that Americans are too hesitant to use nuclear weapons. Yeah, it, it goes off the rails. You can see it goes off the, the rails and to the point that Wallace tries to interrupt and LeMay interrupts him. And Wallace says, no, I didn't tell you this. And LeMay is like, yes, we talked about this. It's like it couldn't go any worse. Um and, you know, LeMay's point of view, we talked earlier about the firebombing of Tokyo. His point of view always about nuclear weapons was that well, you firebomb Tokyo. What, what could be worse than that? Are you talking about the new? That was worse than the Nagasaki or Hiroshima. I mean, we, you know, you use the weapons of war when you have to use them. You don't hold back. Not thinking like many people were thinking, you know, first of all, the the weaponry had improved, but also other nations had nuclear weapons now. So LeMay, while he might be a gifted general, is not thinking about the geopolitical situation correctly and is right. making just a, a terrible comment and also one that gives up all advantages that he brought to the ticket in terms of this was the guy that was to have the military experience and by association isn't Wallace horrible for picking this guy. And so... As can happen in American history, Curtis LeMay joins one of those many vice presidential pick disasters. It doesn't make much difference to me if I have to go to war and get killed in the jungle of Vietnam with a rusty knife or get killed with a nuclear weapon. As a matter of fact, if I had the choice, I'd lean towards a nuclear weapon. General LeMay hasn't advocated the use of nuclear weapons, not at all. He discussed nuclear weapons with you. He's against the use of nuclear weapons, and I am too. Uh, so Mr. Nelson, he hasn't said anything about the use of nuclear weapons. A reporter that I, I watch, a television newsman, said if, if a, a person who doesn't know the difference between death by a rusty knife and a nuclear bomb shouldn't be within a thousand miles of the White House. LeMay's disgraced, Wallace embarrassed, for making such a such a lousy vice president pick of, of of someone who's seemingly so out of touch, LeMay's decision to to enter the national discussion uh, and become a politician backfired. We talked to Bruce about the the outcome of that election and how Wallace and LeMay still came up with thirteen and a half percent of the votes 
and won quite a few states in the Electoral College. So he gets five states, all deep south, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. He is buttonholed in the south. So this is the objective Nixon wanted. Nixon wants to win those upper south states, North Carolina, Virginia, those border states, and deprive Humphrey of any southern votes that he might get and counteract Humphrey's strength, which by the end of the election was increasing. Yeah. Um, and uh, Nixon wins the election. When we talked to Bruce about joining us for a show about Curtis LeMay, he admitted that he really only knew uh, about the Wallace campaign and the shame at the end of his career that he sided with, with you know, the racist, the segregationist. Um, Bruce did the research. We asked him you know, about that fateful decision and how it affected his legacy and place in American history. It also has an effect on LeMay and his reputation. Soldiers that served with him write him letters like, you know, one says you should be seeing a psychiatrist right now. Um, many people tell him he's got, you know, Barry Goldwater, who's a good friend, um, tells him that he's crazy to be going, you know, you're making a big mistake going with Wallace. Um, actually, the Nixon administration is none too happy, too. His uh, son-in-law's, um, uh, I believe, dental practice is, is, is investigated by the IRS. That's Nixon's way of saying, hi, I'm, <laughs> I'm right. here and I'm yeah. not going to make your life miserable. Um, he is told uh, that also um, uh, the IRS agents go to his house, to LeMay's house after the election. And, um, you know, he does kick them out, but um, it's a signal from Nixon, like, don't try this again. Uh, so there's definitely um, his image has changed. I will tell you personally that uh, for me, I'm probably not unlike many where I knew Curtis LeMay more as George Wallace's 1968 presidential candidate and maybe had an inkling that he had some kind of military past than knowing him as a war hero and an innovator in the Air Force. Yeah. And I think that's why this program is important that you're doing, because it is good to, to be more well-rounded about history. Sure, guy made a mistake objectively in 1968. But he offered a lot to the country, and he deserves respect for that. I like reading. Our book recommendation today is LeMay, The Life and Wars of General Curtis LeMay by Warren Kozak, uh, written in 2009. And, you know, it does try to redeem LeMay a little bit, uh, you know, the utterly uh, convinced, it says, of, of people who think he's a bomb-happy maniac, maybe won't be, like I said, convinced. But the more open-minded, you know, it does give a broader perspective and certainly a real deep dive into his, middle, you know, his, his military career, which was one of the most impressive of all time. You know, Curtis LeMay was a patriot. He gave his life to, to defending this country uh, in the best way that he saw, saw fit at the beginning of the Cold War, the beginning of the dawn of the nuclear age. And Kozak's book, really, it, it takes you know, both sides of it. It's certainly, you know, the last chapter about the Wallace campaign uh, pulls no punches. Um, but again, great book. If you want to learn more about Curtis LeMay and the Cold War, uh, go read that. So thank you again to Bruce Carlson. Thank you guys so much for listening. We're already a third of the way through season three. It's crazy to say it. But we'll see you in two Sundays from today for episode six. This has been Ohio v. The World.